Released in 1997 and a huge radio hit, Third Eye Blind's debut single, Sammy Charm Life, on first listen, is an upbeat and catchy tune, but the lyrics are anything but. In fact, the track tells the story of something pretty dark. Couple this with internal tensions over the song and you have a pretty ugly backstory. Today, let's talk about the history of the song Semi Charm Life. Third Eye Blind would be formed in 1993 in San Francisco by frontman Steven Jenkins. His parents would divorce when he was just seven, and as a kid, he struggled with dyslexia. In the sixth grade, his teacher told him that he would never graduate high school, and more likely than not, he'd end up in juvie. He would end up having the last laugh graduating high school and ended up becoming a straight-A student, attending UC Berkeley, getting an English literature degree in 1987. Jenkins would start playing music in high school, playing in his first band as a drummer. It was by 1990 he was living in the Lower Haight area of San Francisco and had rented out his room so he could live in a closet. Jenkins would survive on a steady diet of ramen noodles and coffee, that was largely financed by the money he had stolen from his roommates. He'd of course also write music during this time, and he would refer to this period in his life as, and I quote, my 1967, my summer of love. Prior to Third Eye Blind, Jenkins was part of a rap duo group called Puck and Natty, who, believe it or not, in 1992, got a song called I Just Wanna Be Your Friend on the soundtrack of the show Beverly Hills 90210. Jenkins would receive a payment of about $7,800 for the song to appear on the program. He'd later admit he had never seen the show and used the money to buy groceries. Soon enough, Puck and Natty's demo tape found its way to several industry heavyweights, including Irving Asoff, and at one point Capitol Records nearly signed the group. But when questions were raised over who should produce their first release, Jenkins walked, wanting to take on the production duties himself. It was in 1990 he met another resident from his neighborhood named Eric Gotland. Gotland at the time was working as a management consultant by day and a pretty unsuccessful club DJ by night. He would take Jenkins under his wing. Jenkins would tell Gotland a vision he had of starting a new band and he already had a name, Third Eye Blind. He also had a handful of songs including the track Semi Charm Life. Now, some of the music for the song came from his partner in Puck and Natty, who Jenkins ultimately paid $10,000 to so he could have 100% ownership over the song. Also around this time, Jenkins would befriend a waitress who worked down the street from where he lived, who was also a songwriter, and they would play each other their compositions. He would play her Semi Charm Life, and she would play him a song called What's Going On. That waitress would end up being Linda Perry of the group Four Non Blondes. What's Going On would later be renamed What's Up, and of course she'd go on to have an enormous amount of success in her career. Semi Charm Life eventually would make its way to Randy Jackson of American Idol fame, who really liked the song, and so much so he took it to Don Einer of Sony Music, who didn't. Einer thought Jenkins was simply rambling on the song and thought that it was too different. Initially, Third Eye Blind would start out as simply a songwriting exercise with producers and engineers that Jenkins knew, but ultimately, he wanted to establish a band. Jenkins' goal from the start was to break free from the constraints of indie rock, according to the LA Times. He would tell the paper, I didn't feel like I fit into those whole post-grunge noise pop scene, that movement to democratize the form by playing badly. Third Eye Blind's early inspirations included groups like The Beatles and college rockers Camper Van Beethoven, in addition to the hip-hop group The Sugar Hill Gang. Jenkins would end up playing with a lot of different guitar players before finding Kevin Cadigan, who he'd end up doing some two-man acoustic shows with in and around the Bay Area. They'd eventually add bassist Orion Salazar from the East Bay group Fungo Mungo, and the band went through nearly half a dozen drummers before finding Brad Hargreaves. Salazar would credit Cadigan as being the missing piece for Third Eye Blind. He'd recall to Billboard hearing the demo for Semi Charm Life for the first time revealing he had it with a stripped down drum machine and electronic bass on the first non-band demo. It was kind of one dimensional acoustic guitar troubadoury first position thing with basic guitar chords and some bohemian rapping. There were cool lyrics and cool songs but sort of in one style. Kevin brought the shoegazer and big guitar chord soundscape musicality to the band that balanced out Sammy Charmed. 
During this time, their manager and friend Gotland would finance the project and even pay Jenkins rent and food. Gotland would even help Jenkins establish the corporation known as Third Eye Blind, which the frontman owns 100% share of. He would even be instrumental in helping negotiate the band's first major record deal with Elektra in 1996. Third Eye Blind would release their self-titled album in March of 97. The lead single would be the song Semi Charm Life, and it was ultimately the song that broke the band. It was also the oldest song in the band's repertoire. It was catchy and upbeat, the perfect summer song on the surface. And the track would even feature elements of hip hop with Jenkins telling the Washington Post, we all grew up listening to hip hop and we like it a lot. When I was writing that song, I was banging on my guitar as if it were a drum and free associating a rap over it. But upon closer inspection of the lyrics, one will soon find a dark twisted tale about the downward spiral of a drug addict mixed with relationship woes. You may be surprised to learn the refrain of the song was actually inspired by Walk on the Wild Side by Lou Reed. Third Eye Blind chalked up their morose lyrics and their music to the members' dark sense of humor. Salazar would tell the Central New Jersey Home News, that's the kind of the gist of our music. Our music has a sheen and luster, but when you dig into it, there are dark elements. Jenkins would tell Rolling Stone where the inspiration for the song came from, saying, I definitely write about my life and the lives I see. It's about a time when my friends and I were at a Primus concert and somebody brought speed. No one had done it before, and like three weeks later, all of my friends were addicted. The group's bassist Salazar would add that while the songs they write are about people they know or themselves, they don't want to be preachy about the subject matter. In fact, in a lot of the press interviews the band did for their first record, the topic of the lyrics of Semi Charm Life came up again and again. It would result in some tense and anxious moments between the band and their label. The Washington Post would write about the controversy in 1998. Jenkins explained he wasn't glorifying speed addiction, not after what it had done to so many of his friends. In fact, he said he was merely using speed as a metaphor for the allure of false delights that lead us away from life's true pleasures, like sex. Jenkins would tell the paper, when speed came rolling in San Francisco a few years ago, it seemed very innocuous at first. Before we knew it though, a large part of our peer group was pretty ravaged by it. Speed's a very bright, shiny drug, and I wanted the song to sound like that, but I also wanted the frustration in there, so a real poetic decision in determining the music. That's why you have that bright melodic chorus, but also that dirty guitar sound. Ironically, Walmart, which refused to carry many albums with controversial subject matter, wouldn't pick up on the lyrical content of the song and stock the record. Radio stations, however, caught on and played a censored version of the song. Semi Charm Life would be a massive hit, and has long been considered one of the most popular songs of the 90s. It would become a top 40 hit in six countries, it would top the mainstream top 40 chart in America, and peak at number four on the Hot 100 chart. The band were shocked at the song's success given the lyrical nature of it, and in numerous interviews, they would remark how they managed to fool everyone, even housewives who were listening to the song and singing along to it. Hollywood also loved the song with it appearing in countless movies or promos for films, with American Pie probably being one that springs to my mind. It also appeared in one of my favorite movies, Norm Macdonald's film Dirty Work. Jenkins would offer his own take on why the song connected with so many people, claiming that while the lyrics suggest drug addiction, they could also be interpreted more broadly, telling the interviewer, It's a song about always wanting something. It's about never being satisfied and reaching backwards to things that you've lost and towards things that you can never get. I think everybody has some identification with that. The storyline is just an extreme example of that condition. Of course, the band's debut album had other big hits like Graduate, Losing a Whole Year, Jumper, How's It Going to Be. Their debut album would end up going six times platinum in America. And on top of that, in 1997, Third Eye Blind opened for both the Rolling Stones and U2. So let's talk about the other dark side of the song. In 2000, after the band released their second record, according to The Hollywood Reporter and court documents, the band voted to fire guitarist Kevin Cadigan. He would turn around and sue the band claiming wrongful termination, fraud, and that he was owed royalties that hadn't been paid to him since his termination. The trouble started according to Cadigan when he claimed he was misled by Jenkins, 
who told him that himself and the other bandmates were all equal partners in the band. It turned out Jenkins had filed the band's trademark only in his name on the eve of signing with Elektra and was trying to secure the sole copyright for all the band's songs in his name. Cadigan would claim he wouldn't sign any new contract until he was issued shares in the corporation, leading to his dismissal. Cadigan and the band would eventually settle their suit with the terms of the deal not being revealed. Producer Eric Valentine, who worked on the band's first album and even paid for their early demos, would tell the San Francisco Chronicle about Semi Charm Life, and I quote, a lot of people contributed to that song. It's been around for many years. There are a lot of people who contributed to that tune and didn't get credit. If you look at the credits for the song, only Jenkins is listed as a sole songwriter, while a number of the band's other songs on their first two albums are split between Jenkins and Cadigan. Cadigan would again sue Jenkins in 2018 after not receiving royalties for a reissue of the band's first album was released. In fact, the band's whole history is littered with so many lawsuits against Jenkins from his ex-bandmates and even ex-managers. So let me know your guys' thoughts on the song semi Charm Life and Third Eye Blind's first album in the comments section below. As always, if you have suggestions for future topics, use the link in the description box below. And we'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Stories.